So welcome to the 14th uh, Rodolfo de Benedetti lecture. Uh, this lecture was supposed to take place in May 2020, but then, as you all know, we entered this uh, tunnel of COVID-19 and uh, we decided to postpone uh, the lecture of Danny Roderick. At the time, uh, the title of the agreed lecture was uh, Remaking Globalization. Um, meanwhile, clearly the very productive uh, agenda, research agenda of uh, Danny has further developed and uh, he proposed this new uh, title, The Good Jobs Problem and Updating the Welfare State. We are actually happy to have uh, also this adjustment of uh, uh, the title of the lecture as it falls more in the core business of the Rodolfo de Benedetti uh, Foundation. And uh, it's certainly a development. You know, you may think, what, what has globalization to do with good jobs and with welfare state? Well, this has been always at the very center of Danny Roderick uh, research. Uh, in particular, he has been highlighting uh, the fact that uh, international competition, small open economies tend to have uh, a larger welfare state. This was one of the initial and widely quoted intuition of uh, Danny Roderick in his research, but has been uh, clearly spanning between redistributive policies and uh, uh, political economics and also political science. Indeed, is one of the economists who is more in touch with the political science uh, literature and uh, clearly has a very important interaction with them. Today we are going to have indeed two, uh, also very other two very good speakers. Uh, one is Catherine De Vries, who will uh, introduce uh, Dani Roderick lecture. She is a political scientist and we are very happy that she recently joined uh, Bocconi. Um, and she has been working very much on issues of European integration, European redistributive policies and uh, migration. So many of the issues that will be touched upon uh, today by Dani, but also has been in his research agenda. And then after uh, the lecture, we will have a discussion by Gianmarco Taviano, uh, who uh, has been working uh, very much on uh, trade and uh, again, redistributive policies, uh, migration, uh, and uh, uh, all the uh, policies <laughs> that accompany and you know take into account of also um, uh, 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 should be uh, uh, I don't know what happened but you know I think you can hear me again now yes um, very good so I know that there are more and more people joining us and so let me tell you a, a few things about the organization of our uh, uh, lecture uh, there will be first uh, the introduction by uh, Catherine de Vries uh, then Dani Roderick uh, lecture and uh, subsequently a uh, Gianmarco Ottaviano discussion we are keeping some time for Q&A that will take a place as a uh, uh, you, I, I ask you to please send the messages using the chat device on your screen, uh, and I will try to uh, pick up a few of your questions and ask our speakers uh, to answer uh, them. There is also something else that I should tell you, and this is na namely that uh, this uh, lecture will be recorded, so uh, clearly you should be aware of this. Very good, so without any further ado, uh, let me give the floor to Catherine De Vries for her uh, introduction to our lecture. And uh, thank you once more, all of you, for joining us. Thank you, we are extremely grateful to Dani Roderick for uh, being with us today, and the Catherine De Vries and Gianmarco Taviano. Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Tito Boeri, for the for the for the introduction. I just wanted to share my screen, but it says that I'm not allowed 
to do it. So maybe if you can make me host. Anyway, while I'm uh, waiting for that, I just wanted to uh, uh, let you know that it was easy for me to say yes to this because this book is at uh, clearly at the, when you come into my office, it's probably the first thing you see. It's been really influential in the way that I, uh, I think, but also in the way that I teach. So it's a, a big element of my, uh, of my course as well. I'm just going to check if I can, yes, I can now share my screen one second. Yep. Great, thank you for arranging that. So uh, this is already the the title that we've uh, that we've heard about, and I'm going to be really excited to hear uh, to hear the talk. And I saw already some policy briefs yesterday, so I'm very interested in that. I. Um, I think the clear element is, is that, you know, I wanted to kind of, it's in also in the Bocconi uh, 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 colors, but to one extent, I'm not David Letterman, but I do think that this is a category of this guest does not need necessarily any form of introduction that I think Danny Roddick, especially for the kind of work we do here at Bocconi and many of our students are interested in the extent to which markets can um, coexist with uh, political policies uh, that might be national or that might be more transnational and the ex extent to which they infringe on democracy or make it more difficult uh, when, uh, when uh, uh, countries are fully integrated into a market. So I think this is at the core of the heart of what we do at Bocconi, but nonetheless, I wanted to give a small, uh, a small introduction. So my own introduction to his thinking came with this blog. It's been around already for, for quite some time more, but I finished actually my PhD in 2007 and thought, oh no, I should have integrated a lot of this thinking into my PhD. My PhD was about the extent to which transnational integration in Europe and economic migration wise affected national elections and the extent to which people were expressing concerns about uh, market integration, transnational politics in Europe, in domestic elections. So it really is at the heart of some of the relationships that uh, that uh, that Professor Radek uh, also describes in his work. So uh, in this idea of potentially a trilemma, although you know we can in, we can also debate to extent to which it is a trilemma, or one can find ways to solve it, but of uh, democracy, national sovereignty, and full integration into markets. And I think that's been very uh, clear uh, and and hot debate. And I think what's also really important that uh, that uh, Danny Roddick was one of the first to really explicitly say that this was also an idea I think that came across as being so intuitive that many uh, political scientists uh, and also either working on international organizations or working on the EU, also those working on domestic politics as well as economists thought, well, why didn't I think of this? Right? It's a really important frame to think about the problems that we uh, that we uh, that we all work on. So basically, I think a lot of of the work that uh, has since then developed, may it be uh, the extent to which um, you know, what were the driving forces of the Brexit vote? What were the driving forces of the Trump vote? Uh, we can also think about it in other parts of the world, some of the work that I do on the effect of financial remittances on uh, countries, so the relationships between more peripheral countries and, and host strong core countries and, and how these economic relationships matter. And it very much comes back to this trilemma or the tensions, if you will, between full market integration, national sovereignty and democracy. And I think, uh, 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 Danny Roddick at that time uh, um, um, uh, maintained the position that one has to choose to uh, between that. In the, in, European, in, in the European Union, I guess one is trying to find hybrid forms to deal with some of these interactions. But I think nonetheless, the politics and the economics of these tensions uh, really has been at the core of a lot of work uh, uh, that has been, uh, that has been you know, uh, developed recently about the extent to which, as I said already, trade shocks might be related uh, to, uh, to uh, Brexit vote, rise of populism in Europe, but also to the Trump vote in the United States. And we can go on uh, when we think about commodity shocks uh, uh, link to uh, developments in Latin America or in Asian countries. Then just to kind of outline his uh, enormous influence in political science and economics, I think he, of course, if you remember, I was going through his, uh, his, uh, his work and looking at some of the interviews he gave about his Has Globalization Gone Too Far book. And actually I was just kind of recovering the fact now, you know, has globalization gone too far? You know, if you open up the FT or if you open up uh, The Economist, a lot of this will be in there. But this is from, nine, from the late 1990s. I mean, just to kind of illustrate how a lot of the things that were, that were 
we're, that we're now talking about was kind of already in the core element. I just wanted to cite this. So this is about certain elements where, you know, we might be worried about the degree to which uh, trade has uh, international trade and integration of financial markets might have national effects. So it has to do with social insurance. Age, historically, yeah, uh, historically, the expansion of international trade has gone hand in hand with the expansion role played of social insurance in nation states. Globalization is creating constraints by making it more difficult for nation states to finance these social insurance mechanisms. And my concern is that the social support systems and safety net uh, are undercut while international oh, economic integration exactly. exerts greater uh, differentiating forces on national oh, societies oh, than the domestic political support for expanded trade is also we undercut. Must have this, that computer, that means, uh, um, so, you know, just to kind of think back, this is from 1998, right, when we when we were reading this and the extent to which this has now been one of the core narratives and frames, maybe we've also gone uh, gone too far in illustrating this, but of, of trying to understand the rise of Euroscepticism in Europe, try to understand uh, the rise of populism across the world, Brexit, and also the Trump election uh, in the in the United States. So I think uh, was also the last uh, title was really about kind of to recast our globalization narrative. I think that has been really important to highlight also, I think the extent to which his thinking has been influential in policy circles. It's also something when I go to the commission or when I go to the UN give a talk, uh, many people have read the book or have been uh, thinking about some of these elements. So and just also to give an illustration in his 2011 book, so the globalization paradox, where he kind of talks about the necessity to recast our globalization narrative. I'm very interested to hear today uh, what Danny Roddick has to say about it. But uh, his, his um, view in that play, in the preface of that book, is democracies have a right uh, democracies have a right to protect their social arrangements, and when this uh, when this right clashes with the requirements of the global economy, it's the latter that should give away. And I just wanted to illustrate a little bit in you know how the times have changed, where we were very much having the idea that in the in or the way I see it in the eurozone crisis and the financial crisis in, in from 2008, that it was a lot of the time that national domestic publics and elections were at the um, at the mercy, if you will, of market forces and, and, of, and uh, you know, advocating a lot of austerity. And now we see a very different reaction to this crisis. It might have to do with the nature of the crisis as well, but I think also very much with the changed narrative and how we perceive globalization and that we need to find a workable relationship to perhaps tame some of the aspects of globalization. So I think I can also just underline and underscore the enormous influence uh, uh, that this type of thinking has had in policy circles and just to kind of give give you an illustration of, you know, from the Biden presidency to the European Commission and also uh, in big international organizations that have really changed the way they, they, they view that. So I think this is just a little bit of an illustration for those of you who have not read his books, have not read his uh, articles, please do. I think they're super interesting, especially when you remember at the time that were written and how mainstream some of these ideas are. And I really much, very much look forward to what we're going to hear uh, today from Danny Roddick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much for this uh, for this introduction and for having, uh, in a way, put uh, not only the lecture in a broader context, but also giving us uh, an idea of how, uh, in advance, are uh, Danny Roderick faults. I mean, uh, he's uh, traveling with uh, some twenty years in advance with many of other things we are thinking about. So we are very much looking forward to to this lecture, but we'll anticipate, I'm sure, many issues that will be highly debated in the years to come. Danny, the floor is yours. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, Tito, uh, for the invitation. Thank you uh, very much for the uh, Rodolfo de Benedetti uh, Foundation for, for, for having me. Um, Catherine, really, I, I can't thank you enough for those uh, very, very kind words uh, of introduction. Um, um, and, um, it, you know, it's... Um, it, it made me think about really how much the zeitgeist um, has has really uh, changed um, our discussion on, on globalization, uh, and 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 maybe actually I will um, just um, share a couple of thoughts that go to the points that you were making about how much our um, I assume you can see my screen now. Um, the uh, you know these are you know through you know sort of um, you know. It, it, 
quotes from Bill Clinton and Tony Blair in the early 2000s um, discussing uh, globalization. Bill Clinton, globalization is not something can hold off or turn off. It is the ec economic equivalent of a force of nature like wind or water. Uh, and Tony Blair, I hear people say we have to stop and debate globalization. You might as well debate whether autumn should fall or summer. So what's, you know, you know, two things, you know, one is, you know, the, the this common sort of physical metaphor about, you know, globalization is just something that happens to us. And secondly, this, uh, this idea that we have absolutely no capacity um, to, to shape it or, 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 you know, sort of let, you know, shape it, you know, let alone um, and, and debate it. But, you know, these seem so anachronistic uh, in view of our current discussions. I think it just uh, reflects how much our discussion of globalization um, has has changed. Um, so actually, this is not what I was going to to talk about. Um, uh, let me see um, if I can actually go to to the um, um, to my actual presentation. Uh, so I hope you can see my. My, my actual presentation. Yes, so, perfect, perfect. Thank you. Um, so I want to um, uh, do several things. So um, I, I want to link um, the, the main topic um, that I want to discuss, uh, which is um, the, the, the problem of, of good jobs and, and how to rethink our welfare states, uh, but, but uh, root that discussion uh, in the rise of, of uh, authoritarian uh, populism and actually link it somewhat sort of to our discussions of, 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 um, of, of uh, globalization as well. So um, that's really uh, the agenda that my, my talk will, will follow. Um, with respect to um, populism, um, there are of course, you know, two um, uh, different schools of thought. Um, uh, one school views it uh, largely in, in economic terms, in terms of the consequences of uh, various economic shocks, uh, globalization, technological shocks, the austerity shock, particularly in, the, in, in Europe, um, that have aggravated problems of income uh, distribution, uh, economic insecurity, uh, localized unemployment. Um, um, and then there is the, the, the sort of the more cultural explanations that are rooted um, in xenophobia, um, nativism, uh, anti-immigrant sentiment um, in, the, in the United States, of course, long history of, of racism. Um, and and um, also views the rise of um, right-wing populism as a response, um, the kinds of conservative backlash against uh, the rise of, of social liberalism. Um, um, I think these two explanations are, are, are complementary in many ways um, that they are actually uh, reinforce each other. So I think the literature is moving in a direction where we, we try to not perhaps um, distinguish them as sharply as we were doing um, uh, a couple of years back. And, and, and I want to give my own take on this and, and how uh, the problem that um, the, the central problem uh, that I see that advanced capitalist societies face, how it's linked uh, with the roots of, of, of populism. Um, and I think one way to reconcile these two ways of thinking about where authoritarian populism is coming from is, um, as any economist is want to do, to, to, to distinguish between the demand side and the supply side. I think that helps us structure our thinking. Um, that uh, I think on the demand side, um, I think the, probably the most significant thing that has been documented through a, in, in a variety of empirical work um, is how a, a variety of, of economic shocks, economic stresses and anxieties um, have been linked uh, with sort of the demand for uh, populism. Um, and so globalization technology, as well as a variety of, of uh, what might, one might call market fundamentalist policies, the institutionalization of labor markets and so forth, um, have aggravated um, uh, economic, social, and uh, geographic uh, divisions in society. Um, also reinforcing pre-existing uh, cultural um, values-driven divisions in society. 
But that can't be the full story uh, because you know, those demands for a change, those sort of backlash against mainstream politics or politicians, if you will, have to take programmatic form. And those programmatic form uh, and, uh, is, is, is provided by uh, the supply side of politics, which is by politicians, by political parties, by political leaders. Um, and I think on the supply side, I think, again, loosely speaking, uh, politicians or political movements uh, respond to these uh, demands from below, uh, to these anxieties. Um, for, uh, by uh, using one of two different uh, narratives. We have this of the right-wing narrative that responds by essentially providing a kind of a nativist or ethno-nationalist um, narrative uh, in which uh, these um, dislocations can be folded. And there's also a more kind of a left-wing narrative um, uh, which would target um, sort of financial institutions, corporations, uh, economic policies, trade agreements in the European context, uh, perhaps uh, uh, European uh, Commission and, 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 and European integration process. Now, in history, we've seen both types of narratives. I think it's probably fair to say that um, the contemporary backlash has tended to take, uh, for the most part, a kind of right-wing forms, especially early on. Uh, in the in the uh, in, in the story, um, although if you know certainly if you look at Italy today, it's sort of very hard. It's, it's, it's an interesting mix of of left wing and right wing narratives. Uh, so it's not entirely clear that we can also separate them. Um, in, in in a recent uh, a paper that um, I did that sort of looked at the literature on uh, the relationship between economic shocks and globalization in particular and the rise of populism. Um, I distinguish, I sort of um, laid out a framework um, that distinguishes uh, essentially um, four uh, different causal pathways in terms of how economic dislo dislocations uh, can uh, produce populist outcomes. And those four different causal pathways are um, highlighted by um, A, B, C, and D here. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, and this framework, uh, again, sort of distinguishes between the demand side um, and the supply side and shows the, the inter various interrelationships uh, between them. Now, I want to uh, I want to hone in especially on um, the two of these causal channels because they can help us understand how, in fact, the economic sources, the economic dislocations um, uh, amplify and reinforce and can uh, reveal themselves in terms of right-wing or more values or cultural-based uh, attitudes or, 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 or divisions in society. And so those two causal pathways are uh, the pathways that are labeled as B and D here. Um, B is essentially how economic dislocation um, derives or deepens pre-existing latent divisions in society between in-groups in and out-groups. So as economic shocks this, uh, deepen economic insecurity and economic anxiety, there's a tendency in, 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 in disaffected groups, disadvantaged groups uh, to take refuge in traditional identities and to look at others, outsiders, urban elites or racial minorities uh, as essentially um, uh, uh, sort of, you know, as, as, as antagonistic uh, in a deeper kind of way. So economic dislocation can directly deepen uh, cultural racial divisions and, and, and strengthen traditional social identities. Um, and there's a number of empirical papers that have uh, provided uh, strands of, of evidence on this in the European and American context. Um, the other channel that's very interesting that I want to highlight because it works through the supply side uh, is channel D. Um, and that's how economic inequalities and dislocations have produced uh, a political realignment, uh, particularly a movement uh, in the type of narratives and, and attitudes pushed by parties of the center right um, and, for, and, 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 and inducing them uh, to actually um, use narratives and language that explicitly deepens racial and cultural uh, divisions in society. Probably the, the best represented of this is the recent book by uh, Hacker and Pearson, uh, which appropriately is called Let Them Eat Tweets. 
And this is a book that describes how the Republican Party in the United States has responded to greater inequality, rise of inequality after the late 70s in the United States, as the economic policy interest of the median voter in the United States has moved further and further away from the type of policies that the Republican Party traditionally has promoted, um, the Republican Party has tried to reach out um, to strengthen its base uh, by pushing a kind of sort of more ra racially tinged um, uh, kind of a culturalist and, and racialist uh, agenda in using coded language, but it was an explicit um, way, it was an explicit strategy. Uh, to, uh, to, to, to deepen pre-existing racial and cultural divides in the country. So in, in other words, the party of the center right responds uh, to its sort of, you know, you know it's, it's, it's losing its grip on uh, its voters. Um, uh, and the fact that the median voter is moving further away from the Republican Party's economic policy agenda by essentially trying to catch them back through a kind of culturalist, racialist, um, uh, a narrative, and I think that that describes the story of the um, uh, of, of the Republican Party, but also as a number of center right parties also um, in, in in Europe as well. Uh, in another paper by with Sharon Mukan, we provide a kind of a theoretical um, a framework that precisely has that implication as to how some parties will respond uh, to economic dislocations by uh, by respond by 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 essentially. Uh, engaging in a kind of entity politics um, to compensate for their loss. There's another story that's missing as to where, you know, why parties of the center left have fallen asleep at the wheel while this was going on, but that's a, a kind of a different part of the story. Um, so where this, this takes me uh, is essentially what, you know, to what, what I think is, is the central um, problem that, uh, that um, plagues our uh, societies and our polities uh, at its root, which is that this economic dislocations that are driven partly by sort of hyper-globalization, partly by um, forces of technological change, partly um, because of a series of economic policies that have been undertaken since the, 19th, since the late 80s, they all reveal them, themselves uh, in the labor market, uh, um, in uh, essentially, uh, this phenomenon uh, that has been called um, uh, labor market polarization. I think the um, evidence on labor market polarization has been uh, demonstrated quite clearly by um, David Autor and, and uh, his various co-authors in a series of papers. Um, there is very similar evidence um, in uh, um, across uh, the Europe as well, although the 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 extent of labor market polarization um, is, uh, uh, differs country by country. But essentially what is happening is uh, a kind of a, the disappearance of uh, what one might call sort of middle class or lower middle class jobs with a kind of a, a, you know, a ladder of progress, a ladder, ladder of, of uh, uh, increasing uh, living standards. Um, so think about disappearing manufacturing jobs, uh, which are uh, traditionally, um, sort of the uh, the kind of you know um, the, the the path to the middle classes uh, traditionally think about this, this, the disappearance of um, sales and and clerical uh, occupations uh, because of of uh, digitalization new technologies and so forth um, and that's uh, where sort of this collapse of employment and often in wages um, has shown up in the middle of the uh, the skill distribution and the middle of the pay distribution. Um, of course, there has been a rise at the top, um, no, increasing returns to the more uh, skilled professionals, but also at the bottom, because at the bottom, uh, many of these jobs are either sheltered from trade, uh, so they cannot be as easily um, uh, substituted to trade, or because they cannot easily be automatized. Um, think of a, of a janitor. Um, those sort of you know middle, the, the lowest uh, employment categories actually have not uh, suffered uh, nearly as much. So we have this kind of a U-shaped um, pattern of what has been happening in income in, in, in labor market prospects. 
Um, in terms of you know where, where this shows up also is in, in studies on, on sort of the, the, the squeeze in the middle class. Uh, this is um, across Europe. Uh, you know, this is a little bit hard to read, but basically what this is showing is the negative numbers is the, uh, is the, is the decline in the size of the middle class in the, in the vast majority um, of, um, of uh, um, European nations. Um, where the middle class is defined as households with di disposable income that's between three quarters and twice the median disposable income in each country. And the size of the population that fits that, that description has essentially gone down um, in, uh, in almost all of the European countries. And of course, then we have COVID um, and that has in many ways are, uh, is, is, is um, aggravating uh, these changes in the labor markets um, that uh, um, uh, and and, uh, and and so lower wage jobs in particular have been much worse hit by by COVID and it's not entirely clear um, how um, um, how uh, the extent to which uh, they would they would be coming back. Um, so that is, to me, really the central challenge. I think of globally, um, the big challenge of our um, economies is, is climate change and how to address it. Um, I think within nations, internally, the biggest challenge uh, of social, social, social inclusion is, is, the, is, is the question, you know, where will the good jobs come from? You know, in, our, in order to restore, I think, the health of our societies, and our polities, we will have to essentially, if you will, reintegrate our societies because our societies have been driven apart uh, by these ongoing trends, which for the longest time we've taken as essentially as almost physical phenomena, as in the case of the, the Clinton and, and, and um, uh, Blair quotes, that's something that we can't do about. Now, what I want to argue, and this is now sort of moving into the more prescriptive part uh, of my um, of, of my presentation, uh, I want to argue um, uh, that um, that that we need to think about complementing our our standard welfare state um, way of thinking about inclusion uh, uh, in a much more you know productivist uh, direction, and I'll I'll, I'll I'll make clear what I mean by that, and I'll outline sort of, you know, the broad elements of what, what a good jobs uh, uh, creating strategy might look like and how it relates or um, differs from the standard conception uh, of, the, of the welfare state. And I should, say, I should say, say here that a lot of these ideas are based on work that I've been doing with uh, Stephanie uh, Stancheva of the economics department at Harvard. Uh, many of the specific proposals are based on on a report that that she and I uh, prepared for uh, a commission that set up uh, was set up by President uh, Macron of uh, France, and that was um, uh, um, headed by uh, Olivier Blanchard and Jean Tiroy. Um, so um, I think it helps to think about our different policies for uh, social inclusion using a, a, a three by three matrix. Um, and um, uh, the, mat the matrix along the columns distinguishes uh, different stages of the economy um, where we could intervene. Now, uh, for people who are sort of familiar with this literature, the more common uh, uh, distinction is between pre-distribution and distribution policies. I think the distinction goes back to something Jacob Hacker wrote a, a while back. But I like to, to sort of, so essentially in terms of that older dis distinction, what Jacob Hacker called uh, 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 distribution, distribution policies, I'm calling post-production policies. And what he called pre-distribution policies, I want to essentially uh, divide into two different categories, uh, pre-production and, pro and, and production, because I think it's important to distinguish between the stage of the economy, uh, various policies uh, of investments in education, in health, in access to basic resources uh, um, that allows that that you know that affects the endowments with which individuals and families come into labor markets, uh, from production stage policies in terms of how uh, decisions on employment, innovation. Uh, production, uh, technology choice, and so forth um, affect distributive outcomes during the 
productive stage of the economy, and that's the, that's the middle column. Of course, post-production then refers uh, to uh, taxes and transfers um, after uh, markets have delivered a product. Um, on the roads, um, we, have, uh, we can distinguish policies according to uh, uh, the kind of inequality or the part of the um, uh, uh, you know, income distribution segment that we are most directly uh, concerned with. So we can be concerned with the bottom of the income distribution, with sort of much more explicitly a poverty-based uh, targeting. Uh, we can be concerned about what's happening with middle incomes, with the middle classes, or we can be concerned about concentration of income at the very top, what's happening with the super rich, ultra wealthy, and so forth. Now, um, we can, it's possible to, um, to, to fill uh, this matrix with a whole variety of policies. Um, uh, in fact, a while back, um, Olivier Blanchard and I held a conference um, where, uh, you know, sort of economists were asked to come up with, with uh, their own preferred policies and effectively at the end of the conference, you know, the, you know, essentially we could fill or we could populate this entire ma matrix uh, with um, the, the policies that people had. So, you know, so, but the point is that, that each one of them in fact are doing somewhat different things, uh, both in terms of where they intervene in the economy and where, what kind of income distribution uh, they, they're, they're really targeting. Now, um, I'm not going to go through these individual policies. I just want to draw a distinction uh, between the, our traditional conception of the welfare state um, and the more productivist good jobs orientation uh, that, that I'm advocating for. Um, the traditional welfare state model uh, is largely based um, on uh, the first and the third column um, to a large extent. Um, so it, it focused on the one hand on uh, increases in basic endowments uh, in, um, in education uh, and health in particular. And uh, on, this, on the other hand, um, through extensive uh, social insurance and progressive uh, taxation systems uh, that, that reduced, redistribute incomes are exposed uh, and are designed to take care of idiosyncratic risks that individuals and, and, and families might, might face. Um, it's not that countries with welfare state policies don't use any policies in the medium column, but typically those are targeted uh, towards, with rare exceptions like minimum wage policies or, or labor market um, regulations, uh, they're typically focused much more on things like uh, productivity enhancement, innovation, competitiveness, uh, growth, and so forth. Um, um, I think with respect to the, the central uh, problem uh, that we're facing, this labor market polarization, uh, the welfare state does not target uh, this labor market polarization problem very well, because the traditional welfare state model presumes uh, that essentially good middle class jobs are going to be available to all uh, once we enough once we invest adequately in education, um, and um, as long as we have social uh, safety nets and so forth, they can take care of the people who might be falling through the cracks. Uh, so these are effectively the pre and post-production policies. Uh, but as, as I've argued, um, I think a, a lot of our economic dislocations, uh, inequality and are really much more uh, in the nature of a kind of a, a structural problem uh, that inadequacy or the scarcity of good jobs is driven by uh, secular trends uh, related to technology and globalization. And when those trends uh, hollow out the middle of the employment distribution, uh, then we are going to exhibit the syndrome of permanent bad jobs in depressed regional labor markets. Um, and simply, let's say, investing in education uh, um, doesn't go nearly enough because you can prepare people for good jobs, but if there isn't enough of a supply of good jobs, uh, that's not going to do the job. Uh, or you can do a lot of ex post redistribution, of which I think many countries, probably not the United States, but many European countries have already reached the limit of, but you're really not targeting the source of the problem, that in fact, this problem of uh, poor jobs is a problem that's 
created and reinforced and recreated uh, in the productive sphere of the economy. Indeed, employment, uh, innovation, investment decisions of, of the private sector actors and, and, fir and firms. So the traditional welfare state policies, I don't think are very good at, at addressing uh, the root of the problem, the root cause of the problem, where the fundamental issues of, of labor market problems are, 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 are arising. So that's why I think um, sort of that's what I call the, you know, the, the good jobs policies, um, not as a replacement of welfare state policies, but as a, as a complement. Um, certainly, I think countries like the United States have a lot, and I think President Biden has done a good job, a good beginning on that. There's a lot that can do to, um, to really strengthen the welfare state. Uh, but uh, the issue is that, you know, simply more taxing, more progressive taxation, more investment in education and, and better access to health are not going to uh, be uh, necessarily adequate uh, if the private sector, if the economic, the productive sector is not producing an adequate supply of good jobs. So I think that's why uh, I think we need to complement this, these traditional welfare state um, uh, um, approaches with um, a, a, a much more a directly product, productivist or, or, or a good jobs model. So um, you're wondering what is that good productivist good jobs model? So um, uh, let me uh, essentially give you um, a, a feel for that um, and, and we can get into some of the details perhaps in the discussion. I don't have a lot of time uh, to give a lot of specific examples. Uh, but I want to I want you to think about sort of these good job good jobs policies essentially on sort of four different um, streams. Um, one stream uh, is uh, to refashion our existing uh, labor market policies, active labor market policies, uh, in 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 a way that uh, links up with employers and the private sector much more. Um, uh, much more um, uh, closely and, and, and directly, um, and maybe rather than sort of going through these uh, separately and then doing them in somewhat more detail later, I'll just go and just have a one slide on each one of these. Uh, so the idea um, is, is, is actually, it comes from uh, the experience that we have in the United States with successful um, training programs, and these are in the US context called um, sectoral training programs. And uh, this slide shows you um, a few examples of this. And these have been very successful at, at essentially reaching out um, these uh, traditionally disadvantaged workers and, and uh, to, to get them to, to join the labor, uh, labor market. And um, there are two very, um, specific and important uh, elements that have been linked to the success of these programs. One is that uh, these programs are not purely training programs because they are run in a way that essentially have the, the, the training is very close linked uh, with employers. And that's some, why sometimes what they call sectoral because they provide very specific soft and hard skills uh, that are targeted to the needs of the employers. Um, and so these agencies are sometimes they describe as having two clients. Their clients is not as in the traditional active labor market policies in Europe. It's not just the, um, the workers, um, the trainees. Uh, it's also the firms. They're also clients. And so these agencies essentially do a bridging job between the needs of the firms um, and um, the needs of the um, of, of, of the workers. And the second element is sort of what's called wraparound and individualized services for trainees. So they try to find solutions to the particular problems of individual workers, whether it is lack of transportation, it is lack of childcare, you know, particular gap in their uh, in their learning uh, that's preventing them from accessing um, labor market opportunities. So it's highly customized. Uh, and, and, and providing kind of portfolio of services. Now, the most successful of these kinds of programs actually build sufficient trust uh, with the firms, with the private sector, that they can actually begin to start shaping 
the human resource employment practices and ultimately perhaps even the investment and innovation decisions of the firms themselves. So firms don't simply become a recipient of these services, but they also begin to perform a function where their human resources and employment practices begin to be shaped uh, by uh, the needs of the local labor markets and the local workforce, which is I think where the big potential is. Uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, not just increasing training, but also shaping the decisions of firms uh, in their hiring and human resource practices. Uh, the second element is to, um, to take what largely exists, which is a very large variety of industrial, regional, or place-based policies um, that um, uh, um, have been shown on average to increase employment, uh, but have not been properly targeted uh, at the creation of, of good jobs. Um, and, and, and the typical such program are essentially tax incentives or open-ended subsidies in the US. They tend to be uh, state and local subsidies to, um, to large firms. Uh, in Europe, it's, you know, of, of subsidies and tax incentives to, uh, to um, uh, um, uh, in, in depressed uh, regions. Um, and what we know is that these uh, tax in, you know, incentives, which are largely targeting physical investment, are very ineffective. Even though they are effective at increasing employment, uh, they're actually very costly, very ineffective. Um, and what has worked much better, um, uh, and I think here the work of, of Tim Bartik in the United States is very, very um, uh, uh, um, enlightening. What has worked is that instead of providing open-ended tax incentives or subsidies, uh, that, that is much better to provide customized public inputs uh, through uh, firms, particularly smaller and medium range firms. Um, and, and those uh, customized services might um, you know, include things like training, might include like um, you know, sort of uh, restrictions on zoning requirements. It might include sort of management or assistance with technology, uh, marketing help, uh, consulting help. So there's a variety of, of different uh, inputs that could be provided through these um, uh, public um, agencies. Um, and, and that's sort of a, a model that uh, is much more collaborative and iterative with firms. Um, and rather than sort of these, you know, these ex ante incentives that are very expensive and not particularly uh, effective. And there would have to be a kind of a soft conditionality here that firms that, um, that engage in these, um, uh, that, that draw on these public inputs, these portfolio of public inputs would undertake uh, um, commitments to, in, to increase um, sort of um, high quality, high quality jobs, um, and I think sort of you know getting that quid pro quo working is is you know would be another dimension that would complement much more fully the kind of um, uh, really employer linked um, uh, uh, labor market uh, interventions that I, I discussed uh, previously. Third, and and perhaps you know most challenging, but I think you know people who follow technology closely are actually quite aware. Uh, that even though we take, just as we used to take globalization as a kind of you know physical phenomenon that falls on our on our you know, on our on our lap, fully made that we have absolutely no control over, uh, that that the direction of technological change is endogenous and can be influenced by our taxes, uh, by our incentives, by the development of norms, uh, by bargaining power on, in the firm between employers and employees in terms of shaping. Uh, um, uh, investment um, in shaping innovation and, and technology adoption decisions. Um, and I think in many areas, and of course, most recently with respect to uh, green technologies, we have taken on board the idea that uh, public and collective effort can shape the direction of innovation and technological change. Uh, we have not yet done much um, to, uh, to do the same with respect to innovation or technologies that might uh, augment labor uh, rather than uh, simply replace it. Um, and I think many of our existing systems actually um, uh, subsidize automation and, and they tax the use of labor. 
um, but much more directly, uh, much, you know, sort of in the, in the, you know, there are a whole variety of other ways in which um, the direction of technological change can be affected because there are whole margins of choice that firms and innovators are making in terms of what type of AI to deploy, uh, what kind of skills to complement, what kind of workers to replace and, and so forth. And I think um, this is an area um, where, um, for example, in the context of the European Green Deal, there's virtually no discussion of how um, the, uh, those innovation funds uh, can be deployed uh, in a way that uh, sort of complements good job creation uh, with the green transition. And all the concerns about labor and employment is really about exposed compensation. Uh, in other words, column three rather than column two. Um, uh, finally, uh, I think um, you know, there, that we need to, you know, going back to what we started out with globalization, I think we need um, international economic policies or a system of globalization that actually provides the space for countries to uphold their labor standards and to uphold their good jobs policies. Now, I put this last because I think it's very important to understand that you know, trade policies or policies which is with the taxation of globally mobile corporations will work only if you have the good policies domestically. Uh, that is to say, that's really 90% of the job and the remaining 10% is to ensure that the forces of hyper-globalization will not pull the, pull the rug from underneath you. Um, here, I, I you know, sort of basically mentioned two things. One is uh, you know, that you know, simply you know, shifting the tax base back to capital and away from labor. I think over the last, last couple of last few decades, we've seen a significant increase uh, in the shift of the tax base away from capital because it's supposed to be mobile uh, and towards labor. And now I think the policy discussion luckily is moving us back in the direction where we can also tax capital and globally mobile corporations. Um, I think there's also a need for us to think about how we can uh, uh, expand our trade rules uh, to include uh, a mechanism that would also directly provide, uh, directly uh, protect uh, countries with high labor standards and high levels of labor regulations. Uh, from competition from countries where human rights or labor rights violations are rampant. Um, and I've, I've written a number of places, um, uh, a proposal for a kind of a social anti-dumping clause um, and, and how that might be. But it essentially takes the existing approach to safeguards in the, uh, in the current WTO regime. Uh, and extends it to um, to, to labor market uh, arrangements uh, as well. I'm happy to talk about that. Um, but so let me just end by uh, emphasizing, so you know, uh, again, some of the key elements uh, of the approach that that, that I'm advocating. Uh, one is that I think it has the benefit of its explicitly targeting the structure of our economy that produces inequality and exclusion and labor market polarization. Rather than simply dealing with the consequences, it tries to um, uh, address the structural problems that we have. Uh, second, I think it's it's you know the way that I you know I've explained it. I hope it's clear that you know, the traditional kind of dichotomies between markets and the state, free market versus regulation, really is not very helpful in this kind of a context uh, that we have, you know, kind of a, we, need, uh, we need an approach to regulation that goes beyond the simple, you know, so just letting set the rules of the game, arm's length relationship with the private sector. We need some, we need a state and agencies of the state that's both more involved but also sort of more disciplined. Um, the third point I think is very important because uh, it, you know, this approach involves a kind of a merging of two policy agendas that we've often kept distinct, uh, that we have, we think about, you know, sort of you know, social inclusion and we think about productivity and growth. Uh, but when you think about our challenges um, that, it turns out that those two agendas are not that different. Obviously, from the standpoint of social inclusion, uh, the only way you can actually achieve it in a structural, sustained way is by giving our, the bulk of our workforce, our labor force, opportunities to, to participate in the more productive parts of the economy. 
so the social inclusion and the productive agenda is, is linked in that way. But also, if your objective is growth and you know, overall productivity, one reason that we have this paradox that we have all this innovation, but TFP is so low, TFP growth is so low, is because the benefits of these new technologies are not being disseminated and diffused throughout the bulk of the workforce, throughout the labor force. They get bottled up in a few firms, in a few sectors. And in fact, growth of productivity becomes more feasible, more, more possible, if you have more people involved uh, in those more productive parts. So you can bring the less productive parts of the um, uh, workforce um, uh, to join uh, the, the more advanced sectors. And, and finally, this is a, an approach that sort of is, you know, is, is agnostic about you know, the, the, the institutions that capitalism will evolve towards. Uh, it provides a direction, uh, but it's agnostic about where we might end up, uh, that it, we might end up at a point that is quite distant. So it might end up in a kind of a kind of with a rapid, radical transformation uh, of, of existing market capitalism, uh, but doesn't necessarily impose a particular sort of you know, uh, vision or a design on where that is going to be. It just provide it's a kind of a directional change um, in, 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 in hopefully um, a, a uh, uh, in a way that, that might address some of our structural problems. So uh, let me just uh, uh, stop here and thank you for listening. I look forward to what Gianmarco will say. Danny, thank you so much for this uh, path-breaking uh, lecture. Uh, you know, the issues that you've been raising are so important also precisely at this moment. To some extent, COVID-19 was a stress test to our welfare system. In principle, given that it was a temporary shock, we had uh, the tools to face uh, uh, temporary shocks. As you were saying at the beginning, the welfare state is, uh, has been developed to take into account of transitory shocks and not permanent or structural issues. But that, given that the shock is, uh, is becoming relatively long, we are already facing the type of problems that you were mentioning before. I, I would have some couple of thousands of questions to ask, but I won't take advantage of my position. And I will give immediately the floor to Gianmarco and uh, all of you who are following, uh, please, uh, Send, uh, send me a message uh, with their question and I will try to convey them to, to Dani and our speakers later on. So Gianmarco, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me and I'm trying to, I'm trying to share the, the, the full screen mode and tell me whether it is still- Perfect. And it's moving, right? Yes. Okay, good. So first of all, I mean, it's really a pleasure to, to discuss this presentation by, by Danny. I mean, Danny has been a prolific writer also, not only academically, but also of uh, uh, books that have uh, more, well, that have a broader audience in general. And several books of, are quite uh, thought provoking in the sense that it, they try to put together both of the sort of uh, standard or traditional mainstream uh, trade uh, uh, analysis that comes, actually we have some students following, so these are the ones that are taught in our textbooks, but uh, he's been trying to put them together with more, uh, I would say also interesting sometimes political economy implications and to have a broad view of how globalization in change is changing our life and how sometimes should also change uh, our mainstream approach to understanding the effects of globalization. So it's indeed a pleasure to discuss uh, these uh, ideas, uh, the new ideas by, by Danny. So here, I think that the keywords are good jobs and, and welfare state. So I will uh, uh, discuss the relation between the two and ask some questions in, in, the, in, uh, in the process uh, to, to Danny. So the first, uh, so let me start. I mean, I'm not a labor economist, but clearly uh, a lot of the insights that uh, Danny has been putting forth in this presentation, but also elsewhere in his uh, works uh, are related to labor economics. And so I've uh, uh, taken this quote uh, by David Card, which I would say is one of the uh, leaders, or at least uh, the, uh, the most influential writers and scholars in labor economics, where he says that most microeconomic research in labor economics 
focuses on individual behavior decision and decision making. And here we have standard examples. So choice of schooling, responses to welfare programs, tax reforms, decisions about marriage and family. But then the quote uh, goes on saying, most people, however, if asked to identify the key to economic success, I will say getting a good job. So this idea of good jobs is something that uh, uh, is asking for a definition. And there are different definitions in different uh, fields, meaning that uh, uh, different fields are like different features. Um, I'm taking, I mean, from uh, Clark, from this work of uh, Clark, um, a list of things that may be relevant for a good and or a bad job. So the idea is that uh, the distinction between good and bad jobs is highly multidimensional, and which means that there are several features that define a good job. Um, so there is pay, including basic benefits like health insurance, paid vacation, paid leave, paid parent paternal leave, et cetera, et cetera. Hours of work and then a mismatch between actual and desire. A future prospect is not, of course, uh, in, uh, is not highlighted in, in red, not because it is not important, but because I simply I, I forgot to do that. Sometimes you really, uh, a good job is a job that is uh, propelling your career and also your future uh, economic and life performances allows you to set up a family, to, to uh, get a mortgage, to pay for the study of your kids when it's needed. I mean, all these sort of things. And then there are things that are about the job content, about how exhausting the job is, and then how it is rewarding in terms of interpersonal relationships. So all these things, uh, um, I think that uh, Danny has left most of this uh, implicit because probably we would all agree on this but i think that uh, the, the different patterns the different uh, uh, challenges that globalization is uh, creating to our jobs uh, may have had different effects of, the, of all these different dimensions so this is to say that at least from the point of view of a, a trade economist that is pretty much interested also in labor uh, all these sort of things are are up at the moment, they're not a little bit under research in terms of the heterogeneity of the effects of globalization on, on all these things. Uh, second uh, picture, so the first was a picture of a labor economist. The second is the picture of instead is a journalist and writer, Chris Edges, in, his, in, a, in a book which is not 2008, but it was 2018. Uh, America, the farewell tour. So this is, of course, the writing is emotional. It's not like uh, what we've seen by, by David Card. It's not what we've seen by Danny. And he's describing the collapse of the community in Scranton. Uh, why should be interested in Scranton in general? Well, Scranton in Pennsylvania is the place where uh, President Biden was born and where uh, he, he and well, and it is a place that he always has sights when he wants to sound a bit folksy. Uh, so this is really, I would say, the typical, if you want, from a, for a, from a for point of view of an outsider, the typical stereotyped American manufacturing, old manufacturing city. And so what this guy is describing is the collapse of uh, the Scranton Lace Company, that was the main one in the world, the dominant market payer, uh, in, along in the last decades. Um, of course, leaving a lot of people without jobs, but also having uh, something else. Again, what is a good job? It's not only pay. So of course, uh, these people lost their jobs and so wage was an issue. But then these thousands of men and women who worked for the, for the company were left deprived of uh, dignity, purpose, pride, a sense of place, hope, and self-esteem. This is, of course, the, the writer's uh, emotional uh, cho uh, choice of words. But this is uh, highlighting that there is something else about a collapsing industry, about jobs that disappear. We have uh, heard uh, Danny describing the disappearance of uh, uh, this um, uh, middle class jobs or middle income jobs. And these are precisely the jobs that are described here in Scranton. And were replaced in Scranton and elsewhere by this uh, concentration or these clusters of desperation, loss of identity, and, uh, and despair. So this is, of course, an emotional picture. 
but I wanted to make this point. There are different aspects of what is a good jobs, and, and these different aspects are sometimes forgotten in uh, the mainstream uh, trade literature. And all these different aspects may be affected differently by the different aspects of globalization. Anyway, this is not a problem that is uh, discussed pretty much in the international trade literature, because the distinction between good and bad jobs is uh, mostly about pay, or more recently, exposure to the sort of adverse shocks that Penny has highlighted, uh, import competition, offshoring, automation, all things that are uh, impacting asymmetrically different types of, of jobs and different types of skills. Uh, in the trade literature, there is also an emphasis on the gains from trade and uh, sometimes also on the adjustment costs that are related to this. But there is something else, something else that are we may call the pains from trade. And uh, these are related to a permanent or permanent, at least in the foreseeable future, losses of jobs, of quality jobs and of all sorts of those psychological uh, features that we discussed before. And this may be quite a long run. So there is this paper by uh, Rice and Venables on uh, industrial clusters in the UK. And what they show that essentially the places that are nowadays disadvantaged are still the place that were disadvantaged in the 70s, that is, that were the first that were hit by the structural change in manufacturing in, uh, in the UK uh, now, uh, almost uh, uh, 40 years ago. So it is true at some point things may, may change, but it takes quite a long time. And that is why these things in the foreseeable future, there is this social footprint of globalization. Um, it is distinct from the adjustment cost. And this is, I think, what Tito was just mentioning. There is some permanent loss in this footprint that uh, remains there. I mean, because the adjustment cost, by definition, is something that you pay because you have just, but then it disappears when you have adjusted. Differently, uh, these permanent losses are going to stay there because there are unsolved problems. And so the second, uh, I mean, the, the, the second thing that I would highlight, and we'll also ask Danny to, to comment a little bit more on, is uh, on top of what is a good job um, uh, in terms of, uh, from the point of view of the individual. Also, this idea that uh, has been, uh, has come out, and it has stressed, as I said before, that welfare state policies uh, typically are thought as something that you need during the adjustment. So the sort of adjustment funds that are needed to adjust to globalization. But then it's, if, a lot of the problems of the social distress highlighted by Danny remains also in the long run, then maybe we have to rethink a little bit more of uh, how we should design these tools because they may become, at least some of them may become permanent. At the same time, you don't want to have something permanent that is destroying all the incentives for change. And this is uh, the, one of the last things that uh, Danny mentioned also is that, uh, once we, in, we think that uh, aspects of work beyond pay are relevant, then, I mean, we, st we have to start thinking where we should intervene in terms of uh, uh, creating what uh, in sports could be, uh, would be defined a competitive balance between uh, different countries or a common playground. Uh, should we intervene in trade agreements in, with the inclusion of social dumping policies? Uh, is this the only way to enforce you know, or to force in uh, other countries that may not have uh, the standards of the countries we, we live in uh, to force them to follow this sort of type of, uh, of directions uh, of creation of, uh, of good jobs in the way that uh, Danny has highlighted? So this is, I think it is a very, as usual, I would say, that Danny's presentation is, is uh, thought provoking and quite enlightening. And I, I would like to, to hear more about what are indeed these good jobs and uh, which aspects should we take care mostly and how we should take care of them. And of course, uh, these permanent uh, tools of welfare state policies. Thank you, Gianmarco. I would not hesitate to say that uh, your discussion was definitely a good job uh, because it raised the 
most important issue. I'm sure that Danny will want to react to what you said, but uh, I have already a few questions that came from the floor, and uh, perhaps uh, Danny want to take uh, a couple of those. Uh, I will uh, suggest two that are quite related. And uh, uh, the first one is from uh, uh, Tommaso uh, Nigra. Uh, he was uh, asking, uh, um, do you what do you think is the role of labor unions? since this breaking through of institutional fetishism. Uh, does the end of a contraposition of state and capital entails a renewed role of labor organization? And related to this, another question by, uh, I have only the initials, uh, GP, uh, is more on the social economy, uh, whether uh, the model of a social economy, something that resembles your notion of the of the, of the good uh, jobs. So perhaps you want to start from those and I will take a few more uh, from the floor. Danny. Thank you, thank you, Tiso. Thanks a lot, uh, Gianmarco. I think that was very, really, um, I, I think goes beyond a good job. I think it was sort of like, a, a, you know, the top end. <laughs> Um, so thank you. I, I appreciate that. Let me just um, you know, comment and amplify a number of things. First, I'm, I'm really glad that you you emphasize that you know the, the definition of a good job is 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 multidimensional. I think this is very important. It's not just about pay. It's about a sense of purpose. It's about a sense of career ladders and progress. It's some sense of personal autonomy personal agency, sense of, you know, a lot of is, is a job is part of our expressive identities. And I think this is, so I don't want to fetishize jobs as the only way that we develop our identities and we can envisage a world in which, you know, just as, you know, Marx uh, and then Keynes sort of said that, you know, would be uh, like, you know, fish, you know, um, working two hours in the morning, then fishing in the afternoon and, and, and being a theater critic in the evening. And that would be that would make us perfectly happy. But I, I, you know, but certainly in the in the foreseeable future, you know, good, satisfying job will be part of our, you know, our our, our identities and our sort of our, our sense of uh, uh, who we are. And we know that there's nothing that does more to our sense of self worth and and well being than losing a job. So I think that you know, so but it's not just pay. It's it's multidimensional. And I think it's because it's it's it's, it's multidimensional. It's highly subjective and also therefore highly contextual. What is a good job in one country is not going to be a good job in another country. What's a good job in the Northeast is not going to be a good job in the Southwest. Um, and so, for all those reasons, I think I didn't spend a lot of time talking about sort of the you know the broader ideas about regulation and governance that un underlie all of my proposals. Uh, but I sort of you know, very quickly mentioned that it, it is not the standard, you know, economist conception of, of arm's length regulation. And, and I think the whole sort of multidimensionality of what a good job is provides a kind of a window as to why this standard model might not work. Because if, if, if you were to think, for example, oh, good job, you know, there's a good job externality. And therefore, what you need to do is basically just to apply Pigovian um, Pigovian um, uh, uh, subsidy, and therefore the solution is a kind of an ex ante Pigovian subsidy to uh, to for good jobs, and you're done. Um, now, it, 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 it's from the fact that we know that employment subsidies don't necessarily work very effectively. When you think about the nature of a good job, that's highly multidimensional and therefore also tight, very tightly linked with company practices, firm level human res you know, resource practices, then it's both high dimensional and also, you know, sort of it has a high dimensional uncertainty and contextuality that associates with it. And therefore you need a different mechanism of governance that's going to be much more iterative, much more designed to elicit information over the process of regulation over time uh, than the standard principal agent regulatory model that assumes that the nature of uncertainty is limited and you have to work against it and take it as a constraint. So I think I'm using your point about multidimensionality both to emphasize it, but also to underscore that when you take it seriously, it requires a different you know, state market relationship than 
um, than, uh, than, than the standard regulatory arm's length principal agent model that, that economists carry in their head when they think about um, you know, addressing uh, market failures. Um, I think maybe this also is partly my answer to the final question about social market economy. I think it's, that's what I have in mind is, 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 this, is a regime like that. Um, let me say also something about a point that, you know, Gianmarco, you said about um, when you think about the long-term scars that the disappearance of good jobs creates, then it becomes not just an adjustment problem, it becomes a permanent problem. I just want to maybe put a footnote there that in traditional trade theory, as, as you know, the distributive effects are not transitional. So there are adjustment costs, but when we talk about redistributive effects, alongside, you know, along the lines of Stolper-Samuelson and all the various extensions of that theorem, uh, those are permanent effects. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you think that, you know, once all the low-skilled people die out and once all the disadvantaged regions will get completely depopulated, then maybe only the winners will be left. But there's nothing in trade theory, even at the level of so the narrow distributive aspects of uh, globalization, those are not adjustment costs. They're not transitional, they're permanent. When you add these longer effects, it's much more like you know, adding a layer of hysteresis on top. Uh, so I would say it's really more about hysteresis rather than short-term versus long-term because you know, the, long, the long-term was already in our received theory. On, on, on social dumping, and, and I think this is a huge discussion that we don't, I don't think we'd have time to get into. So the one big question is, what's the appropriate role for international agreements on upholding labor standards versus each country going its own way and with um, a kind of social anti-dumping clause that allows it to impose protection? I'm very much, I think that, you know, our instinct as economists always to think of international cooperation is always good. And let me use the example of the current discussions on corporate income taxation right now. So, you know, I'm, 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 I'm amazed compared to sort of our discussion of a you know, couple of decades ago, how much the economists you know, love the idea of a minimum, global minimum corporate income tax. Um, uh, but you know, I can understand the logic of this for you know, true tax havens, for why, you know, because you know, Cayman Islands and Bahamas and you know, true tax havens are purely engaged in a beggar thy neighbor policy of shifting pure paper profits and understand why you may want to have international disciplines. But I don't understand why if Singapore or the Netherlands or Ireland has decided that for their own purpose that they actually like a low corporate tax base, they shouldn't be allowed to have a low corporate tax for all firms that operate in their own jurisdiction. And the idea that the United States would have this extraterritoriality that if a company that operates in Singapore, if Singapore taxes them at 17% and the United States thinks it's 27%, that the difference will then be taxed by the US, by the IRS, even though it's a US headquartered corporation, but it's actually an entity in Singapore because it's a subsidiary in Singapore. Now that kind of extraterritoriality, I think is problematic. So that's why I think that I find normatively more appealing in general the notion that when different nations have different conceptions about what appropriate social standards or labor standards or tax rates ought to be, uh, that there ought to be more self-help rather than um, uh, you know, simply, um, simply you know, trying to negotiate a common uh, harmonized standards on all countries uh, even though if they may not be appropriate for the needs of, needs of all countries. Now, of course, there are some things in labor rights like human basic labor rights, basic human rights that I think do think it should be common. Uh, but I think even once there will be a lot of things that we won't necessarily agree on. Uh, so, you know, to, to some extent, um, a kind of a social anti-dumping clause might make sense. Um, but, it's the, but there are a lot of questions there as to what would be an appropriate ground on which to uh, apply a trade remedy and not. Um, and obviously we don't want to penalize countries where let's say minimum wages are low because labor productivity is low. So I would exclude that as a case where you know, it you know, would not be a case of social dumping, but it would be potentially as a case of social dumping when you have uh, 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 labor practices that grossly violate um, 
um, you know, sort of, um, you know, abs you know, uh, labor rights such as rights of collective bargaining, uh, you know, um, uh, reasonable uh, safety in the workplace, um, you know, child labor and things like that. Um, on, on, on labor unions, I think, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's, I, I would include labor unions as a very important partner in this kind of governance arrangements and dialogue, but I don't think we can simply rely on, uh, on, on, on uh, labor markets getting stronger. I think there are a variety of ways in which these arrangements can be undertaken that does not necessarily rely on, on labor, labor unions. For example, often it may make more sense to uh, imagine sectoral wage bargains uh, or sectoral bargains on good jobs, um, such as, for example, the gig economy, um, like the ride-sharing platform, you know, having a common standard there, even if the uh, workers, um, uh, uh, Uber drivers and so forth, are not necessarily unionized. I think that's sort of an extension like the French system where, you know, unionization is not very, uh, you, know, it, you know, unions are not, you know, there's not very large union coverage. Uh, but sectoral uh, agreements essentially impose, um, you know, a certain high level of of of, of labor uh, labor standards. So I would think of them as part of this, but not necessarily as the only vehicle to achieve um, the outcomes we want. Sorry, Tito, just taking maybe too long. Well, no, no, no. Well done. Uh, I think we can take another round of questions because we want to close by uh, by four thirty. Uh, so I have a few that uh, came out. Uh, there was one by, um, uh, uh, here we are. Um, it was on training. Uh, yeah, it was uh, Paola Retti was asking uh, education and training in partnership with private companies. Can they prevent negative consequences over specialized local labor markets? They were stated due to import shocks. So that was one. Then Daniel Gross was asking, was uh, raising this issue, most of the evidence that the globalization destroys uh, good jobs comes from the US and other Anglo-Saxon countries in Germany and much of Northern Europe. Trade is seen as a source of good jobs. The more positive experience of those Northern European countries suggests that it is possible to reconcile globalization and good jobs. And these countries simply apply Danny's recommendation, that is the question by Daniel Gross. And then Wiener Salverda is asking how to come to grips with a drastic increase in uh, better educated labor supply that has occurred within the welfare state countries themselves, irrespective of globalization and technological change, and the combination of involved workers into dual learning households, a result of which this household have come to massively populate the top 10% of income distribution and are partly competing for jobs across the entire wage distribution. Uh, let me add then my, my question, but, uh, um, and it's, uh, it won't be a yes or no, so it won't take a long time. When I read the word good jobs, the first thing I thought was uh, one monopsony, which is way more developed in uh, Europe and in the US that we fought and is clearly squeezing wages because of this power that uh, employers have by a non-compete and other restriction on workers' mobility. And I wonder whether this belongs to your policy for good jobs. Second thing is contractual dualism, which is very important in Europe, but also in the US, there are all of these workers doing this uh, replacement, short-term replacement jobs and are to some extent even more a social problem. Not so many, but 3% of the workforce, but they keep on doing this uh, temporary replacement of personal leave and these are low qualified and with no prospective workers. And finally, something that we learned during the uh, COVID-19 crisis, the combination of remote working and poor housing conditions. But these are working conditions, de facto, and uh, no, I no doubt we will come out of this uh, crisis with more remote working, and there is a huge problem direct interaction between uh, uh, work and housing. And I wonder whether this is something that governments should worry about. So I think, uh, yeah, these are questions. And I'm, I'm, I apologize with all of those who ask questions, but unfortunately, we don't have time to go through all of them. Yeah, thank you again. I, I, very good, very good. Um, 
questions. Um, I think the first one was about uh, the role of private companies in providing um, education uh, and, and, and training. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think in, in practice, it's going to be mostly, um, no, I shouldn't say mostly, I mean, in the US, um, you know, community colleges uh, play a very big role in providing the the training uh, for um, you know new job seekers, uh, but there's no reason why um, you know sort of you know in general sort of uh, skills and certification um, uh, cannot be provided by private companies, and often it'll be much more effective to do that. I, so I'm I'm more concerned, I'm less concerned about the um, um, the. Uh, you know, the type of training or the, whether it's private or community colleges or the state or more around sort of the, you know, the set of objectives and governance within which it is embedded. Um, so for example, in, 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 uh, in the United States, I think community colleges provide actually a very good job of uh, providing training that's job related training, but they're terrible in terms of counseling and job placement and directing individuals uh, towards good jobs, which is why these, community-based organizations do a much better job because they can deal directly with the specific needs beyond the training of individual job seekers. Um, so you can have private training companies that are doing their job extremely well, but if you don't have a structure in which the, uh, the particular soft and hard skills of, of uh, employers in the region are being, um, uh, uh, being uh, um, uh, identified, uh, therefore, the right training being provided, uh, the needs of small and medium-sized enterprises who might be too small to express their their training needs appropriately, uh, that that those needs are not canvassed, and then you don't you know you know uh, work uh, directly um, with the uh, with the trainees and the, the job seekers. Uh, so if, if you know if the context is right, um, then. Uh, it, it shouldn't matter a whole lot, you know, who is actually uh, providing the, the, the training. Uh, there was a question, good question. I think Danielle Gross asked a question about whether the problem I'm talking about uh, is, um, is, is just, I will put words in his mouth, but just an American problem. Uh, and I, I can assure you that it's not. I mean, I, I, a couple of years back, I was in Sweden and I just basically got this, this, um, this, this response, which uh, you know, the, you know, I think people listened politely and said, oh, you know, you're just too influenced by the US. You know, in, in Sweden, we don't have this problem. Um, then, then uh, you know, a year and a half later, there's a paper by um, Thorsten Persson and a bunch of co-authors that, that shows how the dualization of labor market in Sweden uh, was a very important uh, driving force behind the rise of uh, Sweden Democrats, uh, the, the, the right wing um, uh, authority, you know, the populists um, that have made significant electoral gains. Yeah, maybe it's mostly sort of, you know, it's, but, you know, this is happening even in those countries that we, we think about, um, uh, uh, you know, countries that have very extensive welfare states, very good education systems. Um, and that, you know, that in Germany, we have experienced a kind of a dualization of the labor market that's very explicitly reflected uh, in, in a rising uh, wage gaps between the better paid and the lower paid. Now, not in all cases is this driven by, by globalization. So I think in the Swedish case, uh, I was probably much more uh, domestic labor market, you know, deregulation of domestic labor markets and deinstitutionalization de of labor markets that was responsible for um, uh, the dualization uh, of, of, of uh, sort of you know the inside the, you know creation of a of a bigger gap between the insiders and the more precarious or uh, or, or less secure outsiders. Which, and I should add that you know immigrants are a big part of that problem as well in the sense that there you know there's been a, a very important problem of integrating them into the labor force uh, even in, in countries like um, uh, uh, Sweden where um, uh, this would be an important part. But I would say that that you know that globalization certainly empirically has been found to be an important source of uh, the far right vote. Um, you know, uh, in in Europe, in in the Brexit vote, I think there's a number of empirical studies. We know that in in labor market developments in in Germany have been driven at least in part by integration with Eastern Europe uh, and and uh, in Eastern Germany. So to that extent, international trade and outsource outsourcing have been part of the. Um, of, of, of uh, what's driving this. And I think there's a bunch of uh, studies now in Europe that shows that the China trade shock um, has been sort of causally linked 
um, to increases in the share of uh, far-right uh, populist votes across uh, Europe. Even though I would completely agree that you know, Europe has a much better um, a welfare state system, safety nets, and has taken much better care of, uh, of, of the losers of globalization. And that's why, you know, in, in, in Europe, the, 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 the discussion on trade and globalization is not really about China. It's not about the directly redistributive effects of trade. It's much more about trade rules. Uh, it's about national regulatory autonomy. Um, and that's sort of you know, the debate, the anti-globalization backlash in Europe takes a very different form um, than, um, than in, in, in the United States. So maybe that's, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's a success, that's a good thing. Um, Tito, you're absolutely right. I'll, I'll just, uh, about all the elements that you, you've identified, monopsony and contractual dualism and, and what remote work is doing. The one point I want to add is that the problems that are addressed um, cannot be fixed simply by changing regulations and, and changing market conduct. Uh, because you can create good jobs in this sort of multidimensional form only if you're simultaneously able to increase productivity. In other words, you can't have good jobs without having good firms. Um, and good firms mean having more productive firms, especially among the small and medium-sized segment. That's why I think it's very important that you know, my approach is not productivist. So you, it's not simply a question of raising and unifying sort of working conditions. You have to be able to create more good firms, and these firms have to internalize uh, the social cost of not creating enough good jobs. And that's really the, the complementary aspect that needs to be there. So much really for keeping also the time in answer to so all of these questions. Again, I'm and there are many other questions that came. I'm sure that, uh, as usual, your, your, your talks will, uh, will raise a lot of interest and the discussion that will go on. And I'm sure we'll have other opportunities uh, to continue on this. So I would like to thank you, Danny, once more, Gianmarco and Catherine for their wonderful talks. And uh, all of you for being with us, Engineer Carlo De Benedetti for having made all of this uh, possible. I wonder whether the organizer will allow us now all to have uh, the microphone on so that we can have a round of applause to Danny for his uh, wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.